it was incredibly sad that for the first time in our history, uh, we made moves backwards. And I don't, won't beat around the bush. Uh, there was nothing good about what we've had to do. Uh, I recognize that there are a million concerns and questions that still remain about the decisions that we took that resulted ultimately in the elimination of six departments or programs. I will tell you also that I was heartened in some ways by the fact that people are finally beginning to understand that the decisions that are being made at a state level to continuously cut UNLV and UNR to the extent where we both have lost structure programs and at UNR the additional step of losing tenured faculty uh, are very severe. And I believe that our legislators have noticed, have felt the impacts of decisions that they have made. And I can only hope that it will steal their resolve to do the right thing, to begin to understand how to fund us so that there is a future for higher education, particularly for high quality higher education. I trust it hasn't escaped your notice that UNR and UNLV are the two hardest hit in this last set of go wells. Um, I will finally close in my, uh, I guess, emotional comments about the meeting by saying, I never want to have to do anything like that again. And I believe that we've had a strong call to action. I will tell you that I am uh, pushing a very aggressive plan for how we can change our revenue structure to keep us off the reef in the future, but that that plan can't be a trigger for our legislators that makes it easier for them to cut us. So we need to continue to work together. We need as a community to make sure our legislators understand that our top priority is making sure that there's an educational future for our state, which leads to the things that they value and discuss, things like economic diversification, uh, a well schooled electorate and a more prosperous future. Let's talk about the decisions that were made and I'm going to keep this pretty short and then I'm going to turn it over to our provost and our senior VP for finance and business and our faculty senate chair for some follow-up commentary. We move to eliminate six departments. The question that everyone is asking is what happens next? We will provide notice to non-tenured faculty and to staff in those units. We will give them a full year noticing period. We will then engage the leadership of the units in, uh, in the affected and impacted units in conversations about how we can reorganize in a significant way that allows us to use the resources that we have remaining to carry on functions when possible of the units that have been eliminated. Now I will not promise that every degree will be continued. In fact, we have lost clinical laboratory science as a degree and a subunit within a program. But I am looking, and I want to be very clear on this, for faculty, chairs, and deans to be aggressive and creative. If you thought that because we've eliminated a few programs, there is no threat going forward I would urge you to rethink your stance. I can't promise there won't be cuts going forward. I will do my best to try to try to forestall them. Uh, our team's working hard again on those plans, but 
you know we're facing a shortfall between two and three billion dollars and that doesn't appear to have any magic cure. It is a good time to think about how to re reorganize, to get your work done, and to continue to be efficient and effective. If nothing else, as a defensive measure against any future cuts. So if you thought things were fine and it was business as usual within the units, and I'm going to particularly pick out the College of Education right now, who's lost two departments. Uh, I have made it clear to Bill, uh, and Bill in turn at the Board of Regents has made it clear that it is not time for a cosmetic change it's time for a serious look at your organizational structure and I encourage you and the leadership of the college and the faculty to work together to give me back a plan on how to preserve those functions as best you can recognizing they may be limited in scope but that it is somewhat incumbent on us to try to keep a kernel of those activities alive in hopes of better financial times in the future the rest of the units that are facing similar challenges need to do the same thing, whether it's rec sports or informatics or marriage and family therapy or the two programs impacted in the College of Education. Uh, we need right now to take a hard look at ourselves. The process for reorganizing is a process that will have to occur fairly quickly. If we are going to eliminate degree programs, we need to get it done and move on. If we're going to retain programs, we need to have a clear understanding of how that makes sense, of what the fiscal model behind that might be, and of how we can use the resources that we have remaining to bring that about. We also have a, a fair amount of university process work to do. Units that are being reorganized will have to be voted on. There'll have to be a faculty senate process. Uh, we will follow all relevant rules and bylaws. Uh, and we will be asking all of you to work closely with faculty senate leadership and our provost's office to make sure that happens. In some cases, I anticipate that a combination of reorganization or differential tuition or even developing self-funded programs could be a way of retaining maximal amounts of function in a very bad situation. For fiscal help, I encourage you to work closely with our provost and with our chief financial officer. Uh, I believe that at least in one case we have found a mechanism that could be used to preserve structure in one of the programs and I would suspect that we can come up with some other uh, fairly positive things that will be able to allow us to continue to serve this region. After we've made those hard decisions and we've done the right thing which is to reorganize in the most positive way we can going forward we will take any additional faculty resources that appear to be displaced and we will ask them to step up and participate in other highly valued activities on our campus, activities that have strategic significance. Uh, we will use all of the folks who remain the very best way we know how to use them, either to continue to serve functions or to help the university as we go forward. Uh, because we will be in lean times for years to come. We won't let any good-spirited faculty member or community member uh, uh, not be utilized to their maximum abilities. You will have a lot of questions, I'm sure, about the uh, noticing periods, about how HR will interact with this set of decisions, and about what comes next. And to discuss those, I'm going to ask uh, our general counsel, Richard, to come to the front 
and talk quickly about the noticing periods, and then I'm going to ask Jerry Bamani, our financial officer, to talk to you a little bit about some of the things we may be able to do uh, to um, help people who will be noticed uh, to make sure that we continue to work as a community and try to engage them in continued employment, if possible. So with that, I'll ask Richard to take the podium. Okay, I, I think there's been a little uh, confusion lately concerning exactly what kind of notices uh, will be given to the non-tenure track uh, individuals who will get a notice. Uh, they basically are the same type of notice you get under any circumstance, except that people who would, because of the short amount of time they've worked here, have maybe only a 90 uh, or even a 30 day notice, will be given a full year as if they had been here longer. The, re the reason for that is we're trying to size the force to the remaining tasks. So as the number of students decline in the programs, you know, we'll make do with what we have, but in the coming year, there really will be very little reduction in, in demand needed. So it wouldn't make any sense to give somebody a, a shortened notice because we could legally when in fact we need their services. And so the notices will be the standard type of notices that are given. The difference will be though that uh, they will have the actual reason for the termination on them. Under the typical process, the notice is given, you have 15 days to ask for reasons, and then if you don't like those reasons, you have another 15 days to uh, request reconsideration. In order to kind of get people knowing where they're going, we've gone ahead and put put the reasons on the notice. And the reason will be budgetary reasons unrelated to uh, evaluation of your individual performance. In other words, as people go into the job market, they will be able to say that I was given reasons, the reasons were completely financial, had nothing to do with my performance. And so that, in a, you know, when we start working with various faculty senate committees, HR committees, administrative committees, to help as best as possible place people and put them in the best uh, position to go forward, uh, they will have that, have that in writing. And it, frankly, in a worst case scenario, they'll have it when they go to the unemployment office a year from now. So that, that is a, a benefit you wouldn't necessarily have normally. What we are not doing is curricular terminations. And the confusion rises that UNR is doing curricular terminations. Uh, the reason they do that is because they are, they're laying off tenured faculty. So the only way you can lay off tenured faculty under the code is through the curricular revision process. Now we had all of the same input mechanisms that they had at UNR and we would have had to have and the reason for that is we didn't know if the board was going to declare financial exigency somewhere along the process. And those processes require um, faculty senate input, uh, pro staff input, and, and the president committed student input. So all that was accomplished through those mechanisms. But the end result was, because we were not laying off tenured faculty members, we go through the normal notice processes. Um, the benefit to that to the employee is that curricular uh, termination can be done as, in as little as six months. For most employees, they would have one year under the standard program and then we're making sure everyone has one year anyway. Candidly, the downside is under the curricular review process, there's a, there's a committee that, uh, an employment review committee that would relook whether or not there was a basis. And obviously we had that basis because we had the committees. The other thing is you would hold the positions open for two years. Realistically, I, I think you could argue that that's not something that's gonna make much difference in this case either. So the point is, people will know where they stand as to their employment situation on July 1st of this year. We will then hold our breaths, watch the elections, watch the legislature, and at this time next year, we'll know where we stand a year from now. So there will not be any pay increases, pay decreases on July, there won't be any increases either. There won't be any decreases, <laughs> there won't be any decreases on July 1st. The actions the board took related solely to notification for one year from now. So we have some kind of stability in place and we have our normal HR processes in place and that's kind of long and short of the noticing. Let me talk a little bit about the um, 
plan that we're working out and it's still not finalized with the provost office and the human resources office but what we anticipate doing is really reaching out to all the impacted employees uh, by these budget cuts and being able to talk with them about uh, ways that we can support them, options that they might have. And let me give you some examples because they're different depending upon the type of employee. State classified employees, uh, Richard was talking about the notice, and generally the one-year notice applies to professional staff and the like. The notice for layoff for state classified is 30 days. But there will be a courtesy notice to individuals in the programs that are uh, approved for elimination that in a year from now, in essence, they would get their 30-day notification. But what our goal will be is to try to work with them through the Provost's Office and Human Resources to really look at any and all vacancies that come up now and through next year that have been approved for filling so that to the extent possible, we can put people into these positions and avoid bumping or other issues that might be impacting them directly. So HR will be trying to coordinate all those activities, not only for the impacted employees, but also looking at all the positions that will be open. Because there are, we've held a lot of positions vacant because of the budget uh, cuts, but there are some that will be filled over the next year. Maybe not anywhere near what we normally would fill, but there will be some that will have to be filled and will attempt to our greatest extent, to the greatest extent possible, to be able to place people that are impacted into those positions. We will try to do something similar with the non-tenured professional uh, em employees that are impacted by the cuts. The, pr the tenured will be in a different uh, situation because the provost will need to work with them and the, and the appropriate deans to determine what their activities will be sometime in the future. But the other individuals that are getting notices, we will attempt to do a similar thing, gathering from them to the extent they'll uh, pro provide this to us, uh, copies of their uh, skills, abilities, their resume, if you will, so that we can proactively try to look at positions that might come open for which they are qualified, and to the extent possible, again, try to make some placements there to limit the number of people who, um, or to maximize the number of people we can keep employed at UNLV. Again, I don't know how successful we will be with that in terms of being able to accommodate everybody. I doubt that we'll be able to accommodate everybody, but my hope is that we can accommodate at least some individuals so that before we fill a position, we first look to see their eligible individuals uh, that are part of the budget reduction process. Uh, so I think that's what we're working on with the provost's office. and. The impacted individuals will hear from human resources and the provost's office in the very near future. There's some other um, benefits that we'll want to roll out and make people aware of relative to health care, relative to other employment placement services that um, we can assist with that include activities outside the university. And so we will communicate with all those individuals uh, to the extent that they have any questions and again try to reach out to be proactive. Uh, the president mentioned earlier that we're going to be looking at reorganization of the affected colleges, and that is true. Uh, last week, I asked the deans in each of the affected colleges to begin working on reorganization options. Now, obviously, it's summer. There are a lot of faculty who are away, so we're not going to be doing anything, uh, uh, anything finally until after the faculty return in the fall. But I have asked the deans to start uh, putting together some ideas and some options on reorganization. Uh, and also to look at the issue of resources and degrees to determine which degrees we can maintain and which ones we cannot. Uh, I do want to put to, uh, to rest some rumors. Apparently there are some rumors that X degree or Y degree is going to be saved and that decision's already been made. Uh, I can tell you that is not true. The only degree that, is, that a decision has been made is the clinical laboratory sciences degree, and that is one which the Board of Regents approved uh, the uh, elimination of last week. So no degrees are safe, no degrees are necessarily gone. Uh, that is a, a process that is going to need to be taking place as we assess what resources we have and what our needs would be in terms of doing those. Definitely some of these degrees are going to go away, uh, uh, but at the same time we want to try to save 
uh, those that we can. In addition to looking at reorganization of colleges, we are also, of course, going to be looking at reassignment of faculty. And we are, uh, again, hopeful that we will be able to find appropriate placements for all of the faculty uh, in areas that they consider to be, um, that they consider to be uh, uh, fruitful. We are also working with students in these programs. I have asked the deans to uh, have their advising centers contact all of the students who are in these affected programs uh, to let them know uh, what the situation is, that the board has approved the elimination of these units, uh, and to also determine whether students can, can get through these programs in a reasonable amount of time, which we have previously discussed as about a two-year period for students to complete these programs. And if they cannot, then perhaps to look at other reasonable alternative programs uh, that would also suit uh, their vocational needs as well. And so we are going to be spending the summer working with students. We are also going to be spending the summer looking at options for reorganization and reassignment. And as the president mentioned earlier, also other creative ways that we might be able to keep some of these programs intact. So it's going to be a very busy summer. Again, no final decisions will be made until the faculty return in the fall. This is not something we want to do in the stealth of night. Uh, but after the faculty return in the fall, we will have to move fairly quickly on this because we need to let students who are planning on applying for admission for next fall, we need to have those decisions made and we need to move forward with them. So we will be moving fairly quickly once the faculty return and certainly we'll be continuing to move uh, throughout the summer. Good afternoon. I'll keep my, my comments short. Just wanted uh, to let you know that Faculty Senate is working very, very closely with administrative uh, administration, including the Provost's office and with uh, uh, Bamani's office, and um, making sure that faculty rights are, are, are followed, are, are adhered to, and the bylaws and are followed as well. Um, we will be involved in the reorg process. The Priority and New Programs Committee will be involved in making sure that faculty consultation has taken place before any proposals are approved. We will also um, look at getting involved in ways that we might help with uh, uh, helping non-tenured faculty be um, find, find jobs internally on campus. Um, I thank the administration for allowing us to work very closely. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, we, you've heard a little bit. Uh, I suspect you have some questions. We do have a busy summer ahead of us, and we're going to try to move through this in a way that gets decisions executed in time so that it minimizes impact on faculty and maximizes the returns that we might make in continued functionality. Uh, these are important topics. We ask for your cooperation. One of the things that's hurting me most through what I will call a process that is the hardest for any institution of higher education to undergo is that we've worked together as a team and as a community. I know that we always haven't agreed on everything. I don't expect that departments that have been eliminated are, are happy about that. I will say that our process, while uh, it may have fallen short of producing absolutely perfect results, was a process that was as full and rich in a consultative fashion as it could be, and that I want to thank you all for the hard work that you've put in, uh, for the heartache that this has caused, and hope that we will continue to work strongly together as a university, that we will find a new normal, and that as we move into September and you see the proposals that we'll be bringing forward to the Board of Regents, that we work once again to rebuild and focus our energies and strengths on becoming a premier institution, maintaining our research status, and continuing to move in strategic directions that benefit this region and support our students and their educational aspirations. You all have been terrific, and I thank you for bearing up under the worst of times, uh, and I think that that came through loud and clear when we had our accreditation visit. Uh, and they 
as their first commendation pointed to a campus that had the best morale that could be expected under the worst times that any university could experience and uh, the tribute that they made to the shared governance that we've all used. We'll continue to be receptive to your comments and questions and we will continue to work as best we can to make sure that we get the best outcomes we can from a very, very bad situation. Uh, I'm certainly available for any questions that are in the audience, uh, any questions that any of you might have concerning the process or what comes next, and I believe we have enough expertise on the stage to field them if I can't. So uh, I'll open it up to questions, and uh, Dave Tonelli has a microphone. I was wondering, um, would it be possible um, to come up with a method where uh, the uh, assistant, the tenure track faculty that are now uh, going to be getting notice, they could be given some sort of relief from teaching duties during this coming year so they could transition to soft funded um, research faculty by giving them more time to apply for grants and that sort of thing so that it, it could uh, continue to provide uh, um, funding to the university. Uh, I, 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 I appreciate the comment and I actually think that there may be cases where that's something we can do. I'll also point out that we have a commitment to our students to uh, get them graduated or out of the programs in a two-year period. And so I'm going to trust that discussions between chairs, deans, and the provost can resolve those issues and where it's possible to make sure we can maintain our commitments to the students who are in the pipeline and still afford some opportunity for people to uh, find new ways to finance uh, their participation in higher education. We're very open to that. Okay? Thank you. Show of hands. Going, going. Well, uh, one Way in, the back. in the far back. It, it might as well. <laughs> I look at the state's fiscal problems. It's my expertise. I don't see us getting out of this. A miracle would be we stay where we are, to me. And 10% cut is where I think we're going to be when the legislature meets. We can't wait until this time next year to start figuring out how we're going to cut 10% July 1, 2011, it's my view we need to start now. And even if we end up not having to take that cut, if we start, if we, instead of just looking at reorganizing the affected units, we look at reorganizing whatever we can for efficiency, look at ways to save money across the campus, look at what we're going to do, have a plan. Even if we don't get the cut, we're still better off. But if we do nothing for the next year, and then that hammer hits us, we're way worse off. So are we going to do something? Is there going to be a planning process? Are we going to start? How are we going to deal with maybe another 20 million going off the top of our budget in 13 months? So you don't think we can cut our way to greatness, huh? Um, that's a great question. And you need to know that I've pretty much applied um, every bit of authority and persuasive skill that I have towards launching a rather bold new initiative with our regents, with ENSHI, with our stakeholders in this community. Uh, I will tell you that you've said, what will we do to, off to, to meet a 10% cut? Uh, we will certainly continue to look at every rational organizational approach to taking cuts. But I will tell you that three million dollars cost us six departments. Imagine what a fifteen million dollar cut would do to this university. I submit to you that we would no longer look the same. We would be a very different university. Uh, there are some comments that I usually make about this part of this stump speech that get me in a lot of trouble with some of our other institutions. And so I won't make those right now. 
I will tell you that I believe the state is beginning to appreciate that it has hurt UNR and UNLV more than anyone else and that that can't continue. I will also tell you that the flip side of your question is how will we enhance our revenue by 10%. I am working vigorously on that. I plan to have a plan in place for this university by fall of 11. I believe that the plan will offset future loss. I also don't need that plan to be a signal for our legislators to cut us yet more vigorously, which means we need to be uh, vigilant and diligent in our efforts to persuade those in this community with clout that at a minimum we need to be cut little or none. And I agree with your assessment, by the way. Uh, I think none would be a miracle, but I think that's what we have to shoot for. And if anybody here thinks we can continue to have a strong state educational system without some form of tax, I'm here to tell you I believe you're very, very wrong. Uh, Arizona facing 16% cuts to higher ed passed to the taxpayers the authority to approve a one cent sales tax and the voters passed it. And that will create a billion dollars in revenue to support education in that state. I would hope that we don't view Arizona as more progressive than Nevada, although you may all have an opinion on that. <coughs> but the people I talk to are willing to support higher education if they know the funds will create a future for their children. And I think we have to continue down that road. Uh, I'll bring you more details of something that I'm referring to as the Rebel Challenge later. I'm not allowed to fully vet it yet, but I'm pushing real hard. And I believe it's going to fly. So you asked a great question, and I'm going to tell you we have to raise revenues because I'm not waiting for the state to charge in and rescue us. Any final questions? Oops, there's a couple. Um, I see one back here and one up here. Hi there. Um, real quick question. I'm new to this whole state. One thing that kind of boggles my mind, maybe you can help me to understand, is as if I was a freshman, with as important as college is, how do we constitute cutting how many millions slash billions of dollars from a college? Well, we haven't cut billions yet. Okay, millions then. Um, how does anybody constitute cutting Fifty-five million, dollars? million is about where we are. Uh, uh, you don't ask me to justify it. I hate it. I think it's stupid and short-sighted, and I think our legislators need to step up. And instead of taking the no tax pledge, we need to ask, oh, is it a primary day today? I think we need to be asking people to take the education pledge, not the no tax pledge. And I think that candidates need to know that they risk invoking the ire of the voting public by threatening to cut education yet further. But we have to take it a step farther. We have to have people who are willing to have conviction and to do hard things in our represented government, representative government. We have to have people who are going to make a difference not people who are going to dodge bullets and kick the can down the road. So I will simply say to all of you, if you don't make your views known, then I believe we'll get more of the same. I think that we were very effective in the special session, and I think we have to continue to exert that same level. And remember, this isn't a short run. This is a marathon. And uh, we all need to be busy, active, and engaged through the November elections if we're going to make a difference, and then we need to be active and engaged as our legislators move into the next session. Uh, and, and I don't know what else to tell you. I can't, uh, I, I will not foment you to rebellion. I'll say that if you don't make your position clear, then you know what's going to happen. And there was one final question, I believe. Uh, or maybe I hope two. I'm not the final one. Is there any thought about elimination of duplicate programs of the two major institutions? <laughs> no. Um, Daryl, uh, so uh, let me guess. You're voting for uh, us to eliminate the College of Engineering at Reno. I knew it. Um, there has been discussion of it. 
Uh, but let's be realistic. How many kids going to programs here, maybe part-time, maybe at night, maybe in grad school, would be willing to get up and move for those programs? Uh, I believe that we have a job to take care of ourselves. We're a full-function institution. We have a number of very high-quality programs, including programs and departments that we just eliminated. Uh, we need to maintain our core strengths and build on them, and we need to grow so that we can continue to serve this region and build an economic future for Nevada. I don't really, it, once we open up the Pandora's box of let's eliminate programs that are potentially duplicative, um, where do we stop? English? History? Heck, you don't need two of those, do you? I mean, the, the conversation goes to a very ugly place. So I will tell you, I think each institution is going to be uh, doing what it has to to meet the, the cuts, but that we have to flip the conversation from cuts to revenue enhancements, whether it's self-help and entrepreneurial behavior or whether that revenue enhancement comes uh, at the hands of our state's taxpayers and citizens. We have one more back here. President Smatros, so my question is not relative to, as you would say, the skin that I have in the game, but the DNA that I have in the game. I have two children that are going to UNLV. And with the cuts that, they have, that we've already had, it's become more and more difficult for them to get their classes, and particularly classes that they need to graduate between now and 2012. So I'm wondering if you can address that for those of us who also have DNA in the game. You're, you're tempting me to prematurely release my plan. Um, let's just talk hypothetically for a second and say that hypothetically, one of the problems that UNLV is facing is that as our 100 and 200 level class uh, shrinks in size because kids are shopping elsewhere and taking courses a lot of places, that that deflates our profit center and that as those same kids who are taking classes elsewhere transfer back into upper division, it enhances the cost to the institution. So our business model is pretty upside down and frankly not sustainable uh, with the current number, high number of transfer students that we have. So I would say, hypothetically speaking, a good solution would be that we made upper division education uh, help to generate the costs of upper division education so that we could continue to maintain class selection and not create bottlenecks, and that a good plan ought to take that into account along with the loss of the Millennium Scholarship. I'll leave that as my answer for now. Uh, last question. Uh, just a comment. As the deans are asked to look at reorganization, I work with the council that um, oversees centers and institutes. And there are centers and institutes in just about every one of the programs that um, are being eliminated. And so we need a plan going forward. The deans need to look at whether those units are going to be retained as they look at reorganization. Thank you. Uh, great comment, and certainly one will do. I don't know if people noticed we did have a house cleaning in, in the last board meeting where we eliminated seven centers that were essentially moribund. But we do need to make sure that centers that have active funding, active faculty are considered and part of that dialogue, and I appreciate the comment, Nancy. Uh, with that, I'm going to say, again, it's a, it's a Pyrrhic uh, situation that we're in, but it is not the time for us to fall apart. It's the time for us to continue to pull together and to do what we believe in, which is to create a future for the kids who are coming here and to continue to build a high quality research institution. Uh, we will continue to pursue that. We will not give up on that. We will not accept lesser status. And I ask all of you for your help and support as we move these plans forward in the weeks and months to come. Thank you all very much. <laughs>